an optimal life. I love I love this kind of saying slogan. An optimal life is where you amplify positive affect, interest, curiosity, joy, and you minimize negative affect in your life. And part of the way you do that is by expressing all the affect in therapy so that there's so it's out there and there's more understanding and more emotional intelligence and then you're ready to really increase the positive affect which is everything about play welcome to husband material today on the show we are talking about a topic which is way too neglected and underrated and incredibly important for freedom from pornography we're talking about play and I'm really excited about our guest, Dr. Michael Crocker. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm, I'm excited to be here. What do people need to know about Michael Crocker and the Sexual Attachment and Trauma Project? So I'm going to give you a synopsis uh, as quickly as possible. Some, sometimes introductions can be a bit much. But I, uh, I am a, a doctoral level psychotherapist that um, I guess around 10 or, I've been in private practice for like 25, 30 years, but around 10 or 15 years ago, I did some research on uh, people with out of control sexual behavior. And that subsumes a lot, right? So it's, we're talking about pornography, we're talking about um, interacting with commercial sex, all of that stuff. And, and so I, I had been working with people with these behaviors for my whole career, but then I decided to go get my doctorate because I couldn't think of anything else to uh, anything else to do. So I did that, and but in order to to be able to be accepted by the program, you had to have your your idea, your hypothesis in advance. And so my experience had been that I already knew a lot about attachment theory. But my experience had been that many of the men that I worked with that were coming in um, oftentimes had an avoidant, uh, avoidant attachment style, meaning that they wanted intimacy. I'll explain this more when we get into the affect stuff. They wanted intimacy, but there were blocks. And so, so, and I proved it. Like my research actually proved that most, most research doesn't prove anything, but mine did. And, um, which was very exciting. I got it published and so on. And then we expanded this program. I developed this program around 15 years ago. And uh, I wanted a program that was going to specialize in addressing the underlying issues with people that are turning to either sexual imagery, pornography, or, or commercial sex, or affairs, all of that stuff. And that's what we've been doing. And we have a successful program I'm very excited about. So. That's so awesome. And part of healthy attachment, part of developing real intimacy and getting those skills is learning how to play. Absolutely. Which feels counterintuitive because as men, we're taught to be tough and not to feel and to try hard. So why is play so important? Well, one thing I'll say, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about play is that Men, you know, there's been a lot of interesting research about male socialization. And one of the things, one of the best books that I've read on this is by, is called Real Boys. I don't know if you ever heard, heard of that. Um, and the, what I found so fascinating is that the thesis of the book was that men are socialized out of their emotions. That, it, that if you look at, they, they videotape this. If you look at parents with, with little girls, they have a tendency to mirror the feeling state that they may be struggling with, whether it's anger or sadness and so on. Um, when you see the videotapes of parents with their little boys, they distract them. They give them a toy. I mean, think about this. When you think about out of control behaviors. Wow it becomes like an adult level distraction. You know, people dissociate and feel like they're in a trance. Um, and it's just so fascinating that in the research that these, these little boys were learning quickly how to, tr how to um, take a feeling state and turn it into a behavior. 
And now, and that's a, a huge part of what I'm working with. We try to backtrack and see what the, aff the affects and the feelings and the emotions are. And um, it's exciting stuff. And the other, th so I'll, I'll get into play. It's like the other thing is that, that in attachment theory, they started to recognize attachment theory was not just about attachment with, with parents and so on. It's also about affect regulation. So it's in fact, modern attachment theory is all about affect regulation. How do you regulate your, your affects are in the body, by the way, and then, and then we translate them to feelings and emotions and so on. I want to pause there because you're talking about this word affect and it might be helpful to say, what is affect? Sure, sure. Um, it's, I, in fact, it's very, very important for your, for your guys to know this, is that affect is, is the origin of a feeling state, meaning that it's in our bodies. So, so that being said, so we will have a physiological response. And next thing you know, we're engaging in, we're, we're having feelings and emotions, and then we're engaging in behaviors. And so, so much of what I'm doing is actually trying to help men to develop a emotional vocabulary, mm -hmm. emotional literacy, emotional intelligence. And the more that they have that, the more they make better decisions. So what I'm hearing you say is that as little boys, we are socialized instead of to really feel our feelings and put language to it and bring it up in relationship to distract ourselves from it through a behavior or through some kind of way to make the feeling go away. Exactly. Which sets us up to use porn. And so instead what you're doing is, is taking those physiological reactions because these emotions start as physical and biological. Yeah. Yes. And then kind of tracking the behavior back to what's really going on. Exactly. Exactly. And the one thing I'll add to that is that so, so boys are socialized out of, out of their emotions. Men are dealing with the ramifications of that from when they were little boys. But the other ramification of being socialized out of your emotions is that basically you experience your emotions in your body. And the interesting part of that is that because boys were socialized out of this, they turn to bodily means to address the feeling. Wow imagery, uh, pornography, all the different types of acting out behaviors, they're turning to, to that because they're experiencing it in their body. And that's why with many men, you have to ask them like, where in your body are you feeling this feeling, this affect, chest, mm -hmm. my back, you know, so many people with back pain, that's, a, that's all about anger. I mean, it's very interesting about how you connect certain affects to certain body parts that that feel a certain way mm. and that's how you help men you know you help men by saying like i wonder you know where in your body are you feeling this right now let's see if we can actually label it in fact i have a uh, i have one of these feeling boards where where it lists all the different types of feelings and the um derivatives of those feelings and and I actually, when I run my groups with men, I hand that over to them and say, listen, this is not, I'm not infantilizing you in any way. This is the work. This is the work that we have to do. So they, they accept that, which is great. This is the work that we had to do earlier and didn't do. So now we're doing it now. You got it. You got it. That's exactly right. And that that then goes into the play issue is that so when you think about play play is about being in the flow and so whatever that flow is and we could we can uh, talk about specific examples however if you're if you are socialized out of your emotions you you lose a sense of play pretty quickly um and if you have a, an insecure attachment there's been research to, to show that the type of play that these kids develop because of their insecure attachment is actually compulsive. That play, play when done well, when it's, when it's really healthy, 
our, our heart rates actually go down a notch because we're feeling, we're in the flow. People that have insecure attachment and kids, they're, when they're involved in play, it's much more ritualistic, it's much more compulsive, and think about how that would lead into pornography and plenty of other behaviors, and their heart rate goes up. Mm. So in the play, the compulsive play, their heart rate goes up. And if you think about, I don't know how much, how much your uh, audience would know about children with autism, uh, they're oftentimes a product of neglect for a number of reasons. Not all of them, but a lot of people, especially back in the day when they institutionalized people. But, but they would get into what they call self-stim behaviors. They're stimulating themselves. So think about the implications of that. And so what I have found is you don't have to have autism to be doing this. You could just be the guy that has insecure attachment, that's been socialized out of, out of his emotions, and, and hence the beginning of compulsion. Yeah, that stimming behavior is, is self-soothing, just like masturbation. Yeah. And I really resonate with that because when I was a little boy, my mother was working from home and my dad was gone and she actually plopped me in front of the television for a few hours. Right. And that was distracting me from my feeling states, right? It was pacifying me. And within that, I've come to identify some neglect. That there was some neglect there. Yeah. And it makes a lot of sense why there would be this void of soothing and, and nurture. Absolutely. And by the way, I can relate to that story. <laughs> so same thing. I had a client once tell me that uh, he was talking with his father and his father said, TV raised me. Yeah. And I feel like that's really common, especially now in today's world with so many screens. Totally. The phone is becoming a surrogate parent. Yeah, I, I've, had, <laughs> I've had patients come in, clients come in that have their, their uh, laptop, they have an iPad, they have a phone. They're, and they usually ask me, can I, can I charge this? Because I, you know, and sometimes a lot of times when I go out to the waiting room, they're plugged in. That, that was not the case 15, 20 years ago. People would wait in the waiting room and in many ways get in touch with what they might be feeling in the, in the best scenario and, or know that that's what we're working on anyhow. So they would be thinking about it before they come in. Not anymore, Drew. I'm like... <laughs> I open the door and they're on all these different types of, you know, like I said, laptop, iPad, the whole phones and the whole nine yards. And it's like, that's become an obstacle in terms of the work I do, but it still can be done. And, and we want to validate that. We don't want to throw uh, shame on that because of course, of course we would be conditioned and, and engaging in this. And, and it's totally at this point, it's very, very, understandable and normal and, and maybe even helping us get through. Yeah. The thing that strikes me is that probably what a lot of those guys are doing on their phones is probably playing some kind of game, engaging in some kind of play. Yes. And, and what's so interesting is that, that they, that type of play does lend itself to compulsivity. So again, that's why the part of the treatment, and particularly in our program, is to pull people away from some of those, those uh, compulsive types of play. Because again, heart rates go up, they're, they're dysregulated, um, and bring them into another place of play. And one of the things you had said, you had mentioned the word shame, and I did want to say this, is that de-shaming our clients is essential if we're going to help them to get in touch with the other feeling states. Because shame is like a wet blanket. You know, when it's when you're having, oh, and it's also physiological, by the way, Drew, it's like that you feel the heat in your face when you feel shamed. You actually put your eyes down when you feel shame. Your body collapses, all physiological. And, and it's an essential aspect of treatment is that it must, it must be reduced in order for them to access other feelings. So clearly we need to learn how to play in a way that brings our heart rate down, yeah. in a way that reduces our shame. Yeah. 
And what does that look like? Well, here's, here's some things to think about is like, so play is very much linked with what we call positive affect, which means that there's feelings of interest. There's feelings, and these are feelings. These are affects, interest, curiosity, uh, excitement. Those are, those are positive affects. So it was so cool when you talked about how shame shows up in the body. How does curiosity and interest show up physically? Widened eyes, you know, um, uh, an increase in attention. But it's not the attention that, that would be part of the, the using of sexual imagery, pornography, and these other behaviors. Because that attention is actually more dissociative. It's not really attention because there's interest and excitement and, and joy. All of those are the, the positive affects. The negative affects are distress, fear, anger, all of those, those shame. Those affects are, are, they're very, very hard to live with. You know, and so the, so Sylvan Tompkins, who was the one that created affect theory said that an optimal life, I love, I love this kind of saying slogan, an optimal life is where you amplify positive affect, interest, curiosity, joy, and you minimize negative affect in your life. And part of the way you do that is by expressing all the affect in therapy so that there's, so it's out there and there's more understanding and more emotional intelligence. And then you're ready to really increase the positive aspect, which is everything about play. So we need to get in touch with our anger, with our shame, with our fear, so that we can experience joy and life. Right, right. So one of the things I, I, I'll give you some examples of the, that transformation is, is one of the things I did with my men's group was I had them fill out this play and positive affect uh, survey or uh, interview questions and things like that. And then I, I it's not my usual style. And then I went and bought, bought the, um, I bought like 15 copies of the book Play by Stuart Brown. And he wrote about how, to, your question, how do, what does this look like? If we engender play in our clients, what will that result in? And so in preparation for our talk, I, I started to look at my, my caseload of clients. And I was thinking of one client that had incredible neglect and trauma in his life. And he, his only way of getting out of himself was by looking at imagery by engaging in commercial sex. And we worked on that for years. But as he got better, he started to become interested in boating, and which was so good for him because, because sailing is such a, there's such a sense of, of openness and awe and spirituality, really. So it's super cool that he found his way there. He went through a few other, a few other um, options in, earlier on, like golf, didn't really speak to him. Um, tennis, didn't really speak to him. But then he found the boats. Wow. Very cool, right? I absolutely love that. Golf never worked for me either. My, my dad and my grandfather took me to the golf course, and I tried to love it, but it was too restrictive and yeah. contained for me. I know for other people it's perfect, but I hear you saying that we need to find our own unique way to play. Yes. One of the things that has helped me a lot is going back to some of those activities that I, I did enjoy as a boy that I haven't done in years. Yeah. What was one of those activities for you that you loved as a boy? I was thinking about that when I was thinking about today's interview and what <laughs> what came back first of all i loved comic books loved comic books yes and and part of the reason i loved them was because it gave me healthy form of detachment from all the trauma that was going on in my family especially after my dad died i was much younger when he died i was 13 when he died um so so comic books helped me get out of my mind which was fraught with trauma and PTSD and 
acute stress disorder. I, I mean, there was so much. Um, and it really worked. And I had a younger brother. And so, which helped. I had actually uh, three brothers, two sisters. And so, but my younger brother was like, I was the closest with him. And <laughs> I used to love Spider. I, so I, I love Spider Man and I love Daredevil. A lot of people don't know who Daredevil is, but a part of the reason why I loved him was because he had a disability but, and then became um, uh, a hero. You know, he was, he was blind, but then he became a hero. And I think that there was something appealing to me as a kid that we're looking at someone that had this trauma of, of having a disability and then turning it into a power. And so that's an important piece because when I worked in, I worked in child abuse when I was in my twenties, um, uh, prevention of, of child abuse, intervention, one of the things that one of my my colleagues said to me and always stayed with me is if you have a child that's been abused promote comic books because that will give them a sense of power in a world where they feel powerless and so anyway back to me is i i love comic books but i and i so i also loved um uh spider-man and so what i would do i would get home earlier from school and and my brother would come a little later and so i would actually put spider webs up on the door because i wanted him to know right away that when he walked in that i was in that mentality and that i was going to be swinging off things and you know what the things that kids do and and it, that brought back such fond memories of it, it's not a play alone situation because that's important to find out did people play alone or did they play with others and my brother and I had the greatest connection that that revolved around play, which I have such appreciation for because as I became an adult, I started, like you were saying, Drew, I started to pull things back in that worked for me. And so, so even comic books, I started to read them as well. And I started to try and read other things that were not based in theory and practice, which when I was younger, I was so... Oh, I got to learn everything. Perfectionism, perfection to learn, learn, learn. And that that's not play. That's a different activity. And so I really needed to bring those back. The other play I had was, um, was, and this was more solitude or solitary, I should say, is that I would go and hit a tennis ball against the wall right across the street in this, in the schoolyard. And that was so good for my my trauma and my affective anger. I was angry, everything changed. My father died, we were all of a sudden, we we're on social security and welfare and our lives went from, from I guess middle class right down to, these, to the other class of desperation. And so to me, that was another thing that brought me back as I was thinking about this interview, brought me back to why that was so helpful for me because I needed to slam a ball against the wall. I needed to get some of this out so that I could be more present for my siblings, my mother, who was really struggling. Think about the ne neglect. It's like if your father dies at a young age, then your other parent is most likely going to become depressed. And so there we are with emotional neglect. My mother would be sleeping all the time. She started to drink, it was not good. But my play, I also had a tree that I would climb in the backyard, more of a solitary type of play. All of those things make us more resilient. And I am sure that your audience is, is interested in resilience because yeah. it's, rare, it's rare for someone to have some of these behaviors if they didn't come from a traumatic background. Mm -hmm. you know? And so we have to look at our resilience around the, the way that we try to function coming from emotional neglect, sexual abuse, physical abuse. So those are some of the things that, that I've done play-wise. And I want to remind everyone in the spirit of what you just said, that we are survivors. Yes. Whatever we went through. Yes. Might seem big, might seem small. There is beauty and strength within us because we're here. Absolutely. And some of the ways that we managed our, our feelings 
in the past. They don't have to be the way we do it in the future. So, you know, again, the, the attraction to self-medicating behaviors can be, can be transformed, which is why I love the work. You know, like I had a father that, that did not have emotional literacy, and that's really what resulted in his death. And that was when I started to become a therapist at the age of 13. I was like, like I knew that, that he died because he couldn't locate his feelings. He could not, he, had, he didn't have the, the emotional vocabulary. So then as I got older, I started to get really interested in psychology. And then I got really interested is how do you make men talk? How do you make men figure out what they feel? Because I knew that if you did that, that they would move into places of spirituality and play and positive affect, which is what we want to do for our men. Yeah. What are some more of those activities or ways that you can invite men to play? Well, the first thing is to get them to think about the history that they had with play. And that's why we do the play and positive affect assessment, because I want to see, I want to, I want to take a look at what, what was play like for them when they were younger. Mm -hmm. And importantly, Drew, it's when did they lose that? So if there was actually a free flowing play in their childhood, I get curious to, because you know, I'm treating all men with, with sex addiction is I get curious about when they lost that because, because losing that results in the trans like behaviors of looking at sexual imagery and engaging in these behaviors. And so we want to get them back to the flow of play. You just told my story. That's exactly what I experienced um, in one of the times when my family moved, which was really traumatic for me. Yeah. I was living in a place where I had that flow and then it got cut off. Yeah. And then I started spending all my time in my room at a computer. Um, I can relate. Except it wasn't a computer for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was the TV. Right. So you're saying that we need to get back in touch with the grief and the sorrow of what we lost. Yes, that's exactly right. And the way that, the way that I work, it's a strange way of thinking about it. There's a particular theory in, in psychodynamics that's a, it's called object relations. And it's about how, how does someone move out of this more primitive place where they're engaging in all these behaviors and get to a place where they grieve. And that's what you just said is, is exactly what we do here, is we get people to grieve. Getting them to grieve allows them to have more play. They become freed from the negative affect. And then next thing you know, they're on a boat. Or um, I have one, one patient that after his grief process, there was some sort of program here in New York City where people just went and danced. They didn't even know each other. Every, every Saturday or whatever, it was like a place for people in recovery to come and just let themselves go. And for this guy, he so needed that because he was stuck with his computer and pornography. He was stuck with going to porn shops in New York City. This changed for him once he grieved and once he, he started to reconnect with play. Yeah. And it's so easy to say, hey man, I think you need some more self-care or for myself, like I should really take a break from work or, or go have some fun. But there are so many obstacles in the way. It just feels so difficult to get to that place. Yeah. When we can really deal with what happened to us and, and truly suffer, I hear you saying that that liberates us to reconnect with play and that can be boating that can be dancing right oh yeah i in fact i i have one guy that had, that in his post grief well it's not really post grief we grieve in many ways for many years but he uh he became very tuned into being sensory that he loves he's got a garden he loved the smells 
He loved the sound of the ocean. He loved the smell of the ocean. That's another big one for me because I, we, as younger kids, we, we, we always went to the beach. We were from Long Island. There were beaches everywhere. Um, and that was like wonderful for me. I had to, I had to reacquaint myself with that. But this guy was talking about it. And I said to him, I said, you're so sensory. Like, listen to what you're telling me, that you smell the ocean, that you see the ocean that you, you taste the ocean on some level. And I'm like, let's stick with that. Because that's really you, you getting into the flow. It's a whole person experience. Yes. Which is how children learn. That's what play is. I just read an article that said, nothing lights up the brain of a child like play. Yeah. And one other thing, Drew, is that when... Um, when children do have play and positive affect, even if something bad happens to them, they can actually they can actually get through it. There's more resilience if they truly have that. Not the other type of play that I'm talking about that's more compulsive and and uh, ritualistic. Um, and so that just feels so important to me to be to recognize that I recognized it for myself and I recognize it for my patients. They're all finding. So, and it's particularly effective when I'm seeing them in group and individual. They are all finding their way back to play, and it's really heartwarming to me. It's stunning. It's so redemptive. Yeah. It's, and it's impossible to argue with the power of that. <laughs> right, right, right. There's another side to it. Um, We've been talking about what it looks like to get out and, and garden or swim or just be present to our physical senses. You've also talked about a way that it can happen in our imagination. Yes. Saying that because your child self deserves healing, a valuable way to mend is to reimagine what it would have been like if you had been afforded play and harmony. Right. Right. And so, so think about that. Like, like if someone is struggling with compulsive porn use and compulsive behaviors, it is, it, it gives you evidence that there was a van, I, I like to call it vandalization of their play. Like, like it was, it was in a sense ruined. You know, like when they used to vandalizing, spray painting, you know, houses and bridges and all that stuff. So the so I talk about vandalization because that's de-shaming. Vandal, vandalization means something that happened to you. Not that you just were devoid of play just from day one. In fact, affect theory was all discovered because the, the, the guy that discovered it um, was on sabbatical. And he had just had a, a baby son. And so he's watching his son. And that's when he realized that there were all these different affects that in the infant are just so natural. They're not yet contaminated. They're not yet vandalized, which is like really interesting because then as, they, as they're again socialized and raised, that's where they, there's some point in which they, they lose. It. And so, that is why in the assessments that we do is like get them to think about first you have to get them to think about how they lost it what that's related to um the prices that they paid for that the prices that they paid for that vandalization they need to know it's like if you don't know where you've come from it's very hard to move forward and so they've needed to goes back to what you said about grief they've needed to re-examine and take a look sometimes for the first time about when this started to become a problem, when they started to have impairment in their, their play. So when they come to treatment, once we get through some of that, which is really like understanding the narrative, right? If, they, if people don't understand their narrative, they're not going to know how to go forward. They must learn what happened to them, how it happened, and the other thing about the narrative, it's intergenerational. What happened to your mother and father? What happened to your grandparents? Because we inherit that. We inherit that. There's no question about it. And so you have to help them understand the narrative. And then you can help them to reimagine if they, if they did have play. It's really about fantasy. 
what what do you imagine it to be? Just free associate. This is very interesting that you're saying we actually need to engage in fantasy. Absolutely. And the imagination. Yeah, some people might be saying, uh, excuse me, fantasy is my problem. Yeah. I have all these uh, porn fantasies and you're asking me to go into my imagination? Yeah, and, and that's where some good psychoeducation comes in, where you're, you're explaining to them the toxic uh, imagination versus the non-toxic imagination, which is, which is being in reverie, just imagining and just thinking and flowing. And they must, they have to do that mentally first before it turns into something, you know, like boating or dancing, or I have this other patient that's ensconced in his artwork. That was not true. When he first came into treatment, he was just traumatized, numb. And a great deal, talk about fantasy. It was like, I'm sure you've heard about the differences between, and they're not that different, but romantic obsession versus commercial sex. There's all different types of attachment implications in that. And so again, it's like you're, you, you need to get people to act. And I do it in the treatment room. It's like, what, okay, I know that you lost it. We talked about that really traumatic experiences being raised just imagine and this is part of the questions in the power uh the positive affect um survey just imagine what it could have been what it might have been what what do you think you wished you would have done and then you translate it into and how about now how about now what would that look like now how can we actualize that that's that is the that's when you know you're getting into the real recovery place, uh -huh. which is great. And it's so amazing. I've experienced it. It's for me a matter of of asking myself, for little Drew, my inner child, uh, what what does he want to do? Right. And then how can I how can I give that to him now? Maybe when I go for my next self care activity. I'll invite him to come along and we'll do it together. Right, that's great. That's great because it's like the it's like your child self and your adult self and your adult self can can take your child self and like let him reinvent. You know, let him rediscover and or discover for the first time. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a the beautiful aspect of this. You know, a lot of people come into therapy with me and they they're already in 12 step programs and recovery and and certain programs have this this various diagrams where there's the one with the circles where in the center circle it's your bottom line behaviors in the other circle it's about what puts you at risk and then the outer circle is called top line behaviors what where where people tend to go wrong is that in their top line behaviors, it's only exercise, it's only eating well, it's only calling your sponsor, it's only going to a meeting. And I'm like, it's not enough. I don't say that to them, but I'm thinking it. Because <laughs> right. um, I'm not gonna shame them again. That's not enough. But I, 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 I invite the idea that there are other ways to think about top line behavior, like going to the beach, like, going dancing, like going boating, like for some people it is golf, for some people it's other sport. I have a, one guy that loves tennis. That's what you're looking to do. Yeah, one of my close friends has restarted the novel that he was writing, part of his creativity. That's cool. Yeah, I mean, there is, there is a life worth living. Right, it's a gift. It's actually a gift. Like, you know, and that when you when you point that out and you point out other options of top line um that i think our clients get connected to gratitude that it is a gift one of the voices i hear from other guys and in myself is the objection of being too busy i'm trying to finish my degree i need to pay the bills Maybe other people are clamoring for my attention and I'm having all these responsibilities at my church. Um, and they're saying, and I'm saying to myself, who's got the time for this? Right, right. 
I've been there too. I, <laughs> I totally, there was a point in my early part of my career where I was running from one office to the other office to the other office because I was like working in so many different clinics and, uh, and I was going to school. And so one of the things that I point out to my clients and also relevant to me, I've been a lot better with this, by the way, I'm like done with school. I'm not going back. I'm trying not to read all these theoretical books is that, um, I explained to my clients that that is what we call the manic defense. And they're like, well, what's that mean? I said, you stay busy to not feel. And if we, if we don't address the busy, we're not going to, you're not going to be in the place of really understanding what you feel. So, and, and I didn't create the term manic defense. It's been written about in psychodynamic uh, therapy is that, when people are staying busy, they are not feeling and they are numbed out. And importantly, they are not relational. They're not thinking about their wife. They're not thinking about their children. They're thinking about their email. Man, that one hits close to home for me. Yeah, me too. Me too. Especially like during the pandemic it was like, that's how everyone was communicating. And I'd be like flooded with these emails and, and, it would create, create negative affect in me, distress. How do I keep up with it? And so on. So, so I really do look at the manic defense as, as a very important issue to try and chip away at. And it's not easy because everyone's been indoctrinated into this world of do it now, send the email. So we're in survival mode. Exactly. And when we're in survival mode, constantly... That's a great recipe for then self-soothing. You got it. That's exactly right. Where they, so I, I've always said to people like, you know, we all need to escape what we're going through in our minds. However, the way that you've learned to do that is you may have thought you were solving a problem, but actually you were creating one or exacerbating one. And so, Having that as the only option of fantasy or imagery or not good. Let's expand the menu um, because escape and fantasy are not bad things. Right. Not inherently. Absolutely. We can choose a healthy fantasy. Yeah. Which is engaging our inner child, a healthy fantasy where we are giving ourselves what we needed and didn't get. Yeah. And we can also engage in behaviors that are a healthy escape, whether that's a day off yeah, or an activity that allows our heart rate to de-escalate and go down a little bit. Exactly. Exactly. Very, it's very, very important. The, uh, the reality is that when people are looking at these or, or they're engaging with these other behaviors, it's not good for them. And that's, you know, it, and it needs to be talked about in a uh, de-shaming way in order for them to be able to move out of this and go into another place. What I called this, this need for, for to be able to go into fantasy and to be able to give yourself the break is I call it psychic space, meaning that there's, there's we as, as, human beings we have a psyche it's our mind it's our feelings it's all that stuff but there are times where we need space and that space can come through all different types of fantasy sensory experiences whatever it might be i have one guy that's like now taking up the piano and he's in a choir those are his escapes and then he needs it and particularly in the pan during the pandemic people needed psychic space and they weren't getting it, which was a problem. People were drinking more. They were drugging more. They were engaging more in, in sexual behaviors and out of control sexual behaviors and pornography. It, the pandemic made things a lot worse. So the other thing I want to tell you about that, that I think is important about space is that, and I explain this to my, my clients that come in and they're very shame-based. And I explain to them that there's a part of our psyche that's all about self-punishment shaming ourselves 
in a sense saying we're no good. And, and part of why you then get more attracted to sexual imagery and out of control behaviors is you're trying to get away from shame. And ironically, it creates more. Mm -hmm. That's why that solution is not the solution that you need anymore in your life. So, so I, I, I think that that's an important factor because if, if the shame is not dealt with, and they don't hear the kind of the psychoeducational part of, of course you want to get out of your mind. Of course you want to fantasize. Of course you want to look at imagery. You're, you're, you need to escape yourself. But those types of escapes are just causing you more shame. Will I be found out? What does she know? What does he know? Um, uh, will I lose my job? I've had people, I'm sure you know this in, in your own work, is that, that people that lost their job because they were looking at pornography at work gone gone their job is gone and then and and you just can imagine the shame of like you lose your job some people lost their their marriages some people lost their health this is how important this this topic is yeah ultimately play is not peripheral right play is not optional play is not selfish right Play is essential. Right. Our lives depend on it. I would add that part of the benefit of play uh, and, and psychic space is it makes relationships better. Mm -hmm. Now you can feel more freedom with your spouse. Yeah. You, you can, you're in the flow, as they say. And so really important. That word space is great because after coming back from a really life-giving activity, some kind of play, I'm a better me. I have more to give, more present. Yeah. Yeah. More present. That's, that is key is that if you're, if you're someone that's reinvented or invented for the first time, a life of play, you will be more present mm -hmm. for your family, for you, for your spouses, for people at work. For you personally, Michael, what is your favorite thing about healing through play? My favorite, well, I mean, there's a few things. My favorite thing about healing from play goes back to the, the positive affect piece of like, when, I, when I've seen in me the healing that's come from re-engaging play and, and re-engaging some of the ways that I, that I played before my dad died, that you see, I saw with myself that I became enlivened. You know, that there's the part of us that, that losing play, having trauma in our family, we become deadened, deadened. And so to me, one of my favorite parts of that, this type of healing is that you're seeing someone uh, embody their lives, become enlivened, become much more interested in the world, not just themselves, but in the world and, and, and the caretaking for family and the, the connecting at work, but in a more of a mission oriented way. Um, and so, so to me, that's the most enjoyable part of doing this kind of work is watching people transform and to be in that place of, oh, I'm in the flow now. And it's never a perfect picture. It's always like, you know, what are they, one, you know, two steps forward, one step back. You know, there's, it's a process. But the more, the more work they do, recovery, therapy, and so on, the more it becomes predominant. That it becomes more of what they have. And let's celebrate that. Absolutely. And notice the times when I did give myself some more space and I did find an activity that was really meaningful and enjoyable and savor it. Yeah. Even if it was just 10 minutes, it's a great place to start. Right. Right. As a younger child, when things were better before my dad died, um, we all went to the beach and we would play and I would, I would like, do stuff with my younger brother, you know, playing in the ocean and so on. And so one of the things that in my discovery about my own need for play was that I, I ended up 
going and getting a weekend house that's right by the beach. <laughs> so, and that's not, that's not just about the beach. That's about my health. It's about healing. And so it's right there. I can go there. I can, even, even in the off seasons, I'll be there just to take it in. Sit, you know, be on the boardwalk. So restorative. And we want everyone who's listening to find out what that is for you. What is your beach house? What is your boat? What is your dance lesson? And you've created a great resource to help people do this. We've been talking about it and referring to it, the play and positive affect inventory. Right. I thought that tool was phenomenal. That's actually why I invited you to do this interview. Could you say a little bit more about it? Yeah. What I was noticing in my groups in particular was hearing about the, the more ritualistic play and more uh, compulsive play and so on. And that's obviously why they're in group, right? And in therapy is to, to move beyond that. I recognized how important it was for them to understand their play historically. What were some of the things that where they really lost themselves that, were, that was really pleasurable that felt healthy um and so i'm like i'm asking them to figure out the play narrative in many ways but where it goes and we have you know we're eventually going to share a link with you that people will be will be able to fill this out and then get an email to themselves saying this is this is what this is what we found out when you filled this out you know and that that so we we start with the narrative we start with with things that may have gotten lost and trauma that has happened. But we also focus on which things did work, not just the loss of it, but what did work. And that's why the, the, uh, the inventory actually results in this place of, and what now? You know, again, this, this wonder, being in awe of like, what now? So that once we understand the history with play, and, and some of the losses and some of the traumas. We then want to bring them into a place of saying, it's not over. It's not over. We're not done here with, with play. It's not like, oh, just be manically defended and look at your computer and look at imagery. And no, it's not over. That's what the inventory is saying most importantly is that you have an opportunity to to re-engage in this or like i said engage for the first time it is not over in fact it's an essential ingredient in recovery and therapy amen it's a simple series of questions that will take you back in time to look at what was broken to reclaim what's beautiful and to make a plan going forward so thank you for providing that i'm putting the link to it in the description and michael thank you so much for being on husband material Thank you, Drew. It was a great experience. You're welcome. And guys, always remember, you are God's beloved son, and you, he is well-pleased. 